the purpose of creation and ourselves in it is for creation to become more and more alive. That is the natural tendency of all things, of the universe, to become more and more complex, uh, to become, to, to grow into more and more layers of complexity, to, to become more alive. Humanity has been exploring an extreme of separation. The, the, the horror that has gone down on this planet it's super separate from the one. Yes. Yeah. It's super separate. And, right and, and if this planet can come back from that place, if it can go on such a deep journey into separation, yeah. into prison planet, into the yeah. horror, and actually reintegrate, that is a new step of cosmic evolution. Right? And that's why the evil forces are actually rendering an evolutionary service. Mm -hmm. The tendency of the universe is to become more and more alive and our purpose in it is to participate in the coming alive of the universe. Yeah, that's the, that's the basic, my basic understanding. To participate in the coming aliveness of the universe. Mm -hmm. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. So pumped to have Charles Eisenstein joining us on the show. Hi, Charles. Hi, Alan. Thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. I'm super excited for this conversation. For those who don't know Charles' background, he's a pioneering storyteller of the new world, author of several books, including The Ascent of Humanity, Sacred Economics, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Climate, a new story, and he's the host of a new and ancient story podcast. And you can find his main link in the bio below, charleseisenstein.org, as well as his book profile page and his Twitter. All right, Charles, we have to start with this question. We're both so obsessed with it. Where did we come from? Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? What is the nature of this reality? You want me to answer those questions? <laughs> I, I mean, our, our culture gives us answers to those, and then we come up with our own variants on those, cult, on those questions, on those answers. Um, and the answers that we are given by the culture don't really make much sense anymore. They don't resonate with us. So I've been, yeah, my work is to offer different answers or maybe even different questions or different ways of finding the answers or perhaps different ways of making ourselves available for the answers to find us. Uh, and seeing more and more the value in the question rather than the value being in the answer. The question being an expression of the life force. Underneath the question, there's a questioning or you could even say a questing. Mm. So, yeah, like, I mean, I'm probably, you're probably not expecting me to, like, answer those questions, but uh, that's how I would begin to talk about them. I love that. It's the questing, as the questioner of those questions, that is this life force, awakening life force. It catalyzes such profound awareness and consciousness shifts when we dig into those questions and the modalities that we can take, the different methods that we can take to bring that question more to the essence of our social fabric is beautiful. There's so many different ways to do so. Yeah, like why do you, why do you even want to ask these questions? There's a force within you that will not actually be satisfied even when you arrive at an answer because it's coming from it, it's coming from the desire or the imperative to grow, to become who you can be. It's, that's the animating force that is behind the questions. So it's not actually about finding the answers. Someone asked me today a question, something like, um, uh, how, do I, how do I reconnect? How do I find a way to belong again? And I pointed out that 
what you're really seeking isn't the how. What you're seeking is the actual belonging. That's the drive underneath. And I think a lot of times we take this, this drive, which could even be a frustrated life force that generates discontent, and then we displace that onto intellectualized questions when those are actually sometimes even an escape from the movement that is trying to happen within us. So, yeah, and here you are, you know, doing this, this series, this podcast, um, seeking to satisfy a, a deep yearning uh, by interviewing smart people who have answers. Um, and hopefully inspiring <clears throat> other people who watch to care more about these questions and the mm -hmm. way that these questions can impact their lives. Yeah. And like you said, a lot of people also come back to those questions and say that it is that question that going on that quest mm -hmm. is the journey, right? not trophy of an answer. Right. So the question could lead to other questions. Like that might be the, the yeah. best effect of it. Anyway, I'm very happy to, uh, to be in this territory with you, uh, starting with the questions and who knows where it'll go. <clears throat> I'm so interested in those questions and a th a, maybe a good approach to the, it with you would be... Maybe I just said all that so I could avoid admitting that I don't even know the answers. <laughs> the, the, I, I would be so surprised by uh, people who do and, uh, and I want to know and maybe there could be a great civilizational dialogue that happens around these questions and what could potentially be these answers. Um, let's approach this from this idea that whether you allow spirituality and mysticism and magic in with your understanding of the nature of reality, or whether you take a strictly materialistic, physical, scientific approach, you still go back in lineage, all of our parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, all of our ancestors, all of life on this planet, all of the stars and planets, all go back to the Big Bang, what created the Big Bang. All, it all goes back again to that single source of creation and also asking about it from that perspective of the nature of our reality. What created this reality? Why was it created? Why are we here? Will you, will you speak about that? Like allowing that little bit of, you know, science is like Big Bang till now, evolution, uh huh? And then it's like, what happened before the Big Bang? We don't know yet, we're figuring it out. Spirituality and mysticism and magic have like all different ideas about what it could mm -hmm. potentially be for. We're in a school and we're training our spirit, our consciousness on right. a school. So yeah, how, what do you, how do you uh, interact and engage with those? Okay, yeah, a couple things. Um, For one, uh, you, you know, you, you asked uh, or referred to these two different ways of answering the question. One is, <clears throat> excuse me, two different two different ways of answering the question. One is the scientific path. The other is the mystical or spiritual path. Uh, I would say that I believe both of them. I am a materialist, and at the same time, I think that matter is so much more subtle and mysterious than we imagine that when we fully comprehend or even take one step into a deeper comprehension of what matter is, we discover that it has the properties that we've exported onto spirit and that matter is not actually matter and that ultimately science is going to take us to the same place that other traditions of knowledge took us to. Uh, that um, science is is challenging its own ideological limits. That that you you know the, the program of science was to examine things more and more carefully, to quantify them more and more extensively, and to reduce the many to the one. That's the, the basic idea: is to reduce the the world of of multiple of a multiplicity of phenomena to, oh, that's just 
um, different permutations of a few basic building blocks and a few uh, forces of nature that we can mathematically describe. The complexity is an illusion. It's all actually very simple, therefore very understandable, therefore controllable. So I think that spirituality, various some of the traditions that you spoke of, are trying to do the same thing, to, to reduce a mystery to something that we can grasp. Like you mentioned, oh, it's just a school, or it's all consciousness, or it's all, like, to, to reduce it is comforting in a way, uh, but it's part of a paradigm of control mm. that infiltrates our culture on every level. And I believe that right now we face the possibility and invitation of letting go of that control, uh, whether we're talking about technology or our conceptual categories of the world uh, or the domestication of the wild. Like we've accomplished a lot through technologies of control, mental and material, but we are reaching its limits. Whether you're talking about medicine, um, whether you're talking about um, our understanding of the world, politics, you know, I mean, back in the day, the sciences, the social sciences were supposed to work the same miracles that the material sciences had accomplished in the material world. Uh, we were going to have an engineered, perfect society, thanks to political science, sociology, economics. And we are reaching the, uh, an apparent limit to our, to, our, to our ability to um, improve ourselves and improve the world. And so mm -hmm. the, it, it's calling us into a, a kind of a revolution that is not just about replacing one reductionistic scheme with another one, but to maybe entertain the idea that reality is irreducible, that no matter how we confine it, categorize it, reduce it, there will always be something left out. And that thing that is left out will be an endless source of anomalies, or you could say miracles, uh, or, or an endless source of humiliation. That it, something happens that doesn't fit into your reality picture and you're like, wow, I guess I didn't know what reality really was. I thought I knew, but here's something that happened. And if you have the courage to, to accept that and not toss it into the garbage bin of anomaly or I can't explain that or that didn't happen, then, you know, and you're able to take it in, then an expansion is possible or an initiation into a larger reality than you had known. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I want to start with a couple points that you listed there. One of them being that this idea that um, maybe it almost say maybe it almost seems like then this re the reality being uh, that I would that I couldn't possibly and I think nothing's impossible but that I couldn't possibly be able to compress reality down into some sort of exciting and all-encompassing storytelling experiences that could awaken people and could just get them super excited to be alive and bring their unique consciousness forward into the world and it's fine to do that. It's just that not not to uh, imagine that you have said everything, uh, or that your particular offering applies universally to all people, to all times, to all situations. But it could be a story that makes people come alive, and that carries truth in it, even if it is not the truth. Yeah. Interesting. So we can aim for the absolute best, as we would say here in Silicon Valley, compression algorithm mm -hmm. of understanding the key essences, the essentials of reality. 
as we say with Pareto or power law distributions, that you find the 20% of reality that gives you an 80% understanding of what you're actually here embedded in. Yeah. And then if you can tell that story to the world, then that at least gets it out in the most compressed and excitable way. But it mm -hmm. requires not only your parsing for signal, but it requires you to be a really good artist and designer and storyteller to get it out and land in people's hearts. Yeah, so it's not like, so the metaphor of a compression algorithm um, only goes so far. Because imagine, because the compression algorithm that you're using is gonna carry biases. It's gonna, it's gonna carry an implicit um, judgment about what exists because you're looking for certain things, looking at certain things and not even seeing other things. So imagine if you had a uh, image compression algorithm that, <clears throat> that always uh, eliminated fairies, okay? Like suppose there's actually fairies and, and they, if you use a different algorithm than the image that you end up with, you'd be able to see these fairies. Let me give this also yeah. as an example, as someone that is deep in philosophy, it would be like, I was never born and raised in Africa or in South America or in Asia. So I don't actually have like a first principles, first 20 years of my life understanding of that continent's philosophies of family interactions and mm -hmm. life interactions in general. And so because of that, I will have bias as I make my story that's hoping to help awaken people towards who just who I am and how I was born and how I was grown up like here in the United States. Yeah. And so that's these ideas of these biases. Okay, but then this other thing that you mentioned in that first segment was that this idea of letting go, it's both incredibly beautiful, yet it's like, if I let go and then we, you know, if you let go, you wouldn't have written your books. Maybe. I wrote my books because I let go. Because you let of, go. Okay. Because I let go of what I thought I knew and that opened up vistas that would have been veiled by the the uh, distorting lens that I had grown up wearing. So it's not like, so what, it's not actually letting go of knowing anything. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, it's to recognize the, that the map that you are carrying of the world mm -hmm. is just a map and then, and that's not bad. I mean, it's useful. Maps are useful. But at some point in, in one's development, the map becomes uh, like confining. Um, you realize that there are things that it's not showing. And I think that that's happening on a collective level too. There's, there are features of the terrain that are super important that are invisible on the, on the maps that we have inherited from our modern scientific tradition. Okay, so our map, aka worldview, is limited to the stimuli that we've taken in growing up and experiencing as adults, and from our lineage, etc., and to our experiences that we've had. And so then there are certain aspects to our existence that are really important that are maybe not embedded in our worldviews because we have yet to have discovered them. And the idea of is, is it of letting, of letting go has something also to do with that. You just, good luck parsing for all of those really incredibly important <clears throat> things because if you do, you can do that, you can go out and parse and find these things, but also just know that having a more, you know, peaceful, equanimous, interconnected relationship with your North Star and your journey here is beautiful as you go and parse and find mm -hmm. and seek and disseminate after you synthesize. Yeah, uh, you could say that, that, so these maps or these worldviews, belief systems, whatever you wanna call it, um, these are not purely intellectual. 
they um, reveal the world in a certain way that resonates or co-resonates with a state of being of your own. So as you change um, and fully inhabit the particular reality that you have constructed or uh, that we have constructed collectively uh, and grow into that and then eventually grow up against its boundaries, then the reality starts no longer to uh, co-resonate with who you are becoming. And that is the time to let go. There's a time not to let go. You know, there's a time mm. when, when a worldview or a belief system, it's, it's totally working for you. And your job is to grow. Mm-hmm. And, to, and if somebody comes and criticizes it, you're going to be like, yeah, whatever. Or you're going to be defensive. Uh, you're not going to be willing or ready to hear it. And that's why I don't, I'm not out there like trying to convince people that their map is wrong. Um, totally. Because I respect like there is a time, there's a phase of growth, there's a phase of of limits there's a phase of crisis there's a phase of dissolution and my intention then is to serve whatever phase whatever is ready to happen um you know and if it's not ready to change then maybe i'll just tell a joke you know maybe i'll just uh show some love or plant a a seed that might sprout many many lifetimes in the future Okay, there's also something about this letting go that is, in a sense, hard because we desire to build the new world that our Mm -hmm. hearts know is possible. We want that world. We all collect, in many ways, our nodes making changes, aiming to get to that world. And this, so it's as is, would you would you call it some sort of ebb, ebb and flow along the way of both yeah. building and creating and also letting go and being interconnected and letting go is not something that you can actually do usually for me at least it comes in despite it comes despite my doing it comes when I can't do anymore when I'm hanging on to the precipice mm. with all my might terrified of falling mm. and finally my, my my grip falters and I can't hold on anymore I like that then I like putting go. it that's a great analogy okay yeah. so it's like you've done a great amount of the work towards that beautiful world we all know our hearts in our hearts as possible and then there's the moment of us realizing that hey, it's time for me to go play with my kid or for me to go on that date or for me to go and exercise or for me to go and do these the other activities that could be part of the essence. And there's also something there that speaks to Taoism mm-hmm. quite a bit, being on this the way, but also are we on the Tao? Are we on the way? Have we veered completely off? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Uh, when, when you're in new territory, then how do you know what the way is except to take wrong turns and false paths? You can only discover the true path by, by walking the false path. It, so you could say that there is no, there is no false path. There is only uh, learning from errors and infinite opportunities to learn from those errors, including the errors that you regret for your whole life and wish that you hadn't done that. Um, Somehow those mistakes are recorded in the collective field. And I therefore feel grateful for all of those who have come before me who have made the mistakes that I no longer need to make because their regret is recorded in our collective consciousness. You're tapping in to learn from that mistake mm-hmm. and then not veering off on that. Everything, s- yes, same everything path. you do is on behalf of all beings. Would you call this like a karmic lineage? Uh, I would call it a, a universal principle. Everything that you do is on behalf of all beings. This is 
similar to the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva vow, which, in which you declare an intention to work for the enlightenment of all beings. Mm. But what I'm saying is that this vow is unnecessary because it's already happening. So uh, a mm. more subtle form of the vow is simply a statement of recognition that actually I am working on behalf of all beings, that it's already true. Paradoxically, the statement that it is already true, the statement, the recognition of it, makes it true. This is, yeah, getting into some, some mysteries here. But so, so I guess I, I want to say this, though, because one of the formulas that has guided the modern separate self, the modern individual, is this heroic striving, this, uh, this idea of attainment, this idea that always comes up in the question, well, how do I do it? That question may be based on false premises. To turn everything into something to accomplish, including your spiritual development, mm. something that you exert your will to do, mm. the, uh, to find something to overcome, find something to fight, that whole, that whole template. Um, the action of non-action? That's just one way to do things. So that whole, like, yeah, like, so how do I do it? That assumes that you are doing it. And, but what if it's being done to you? That all of us embedded in this creation are on this journey and that journey is already on this ascension process, period. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no matter how you state it, I would probably be able to say, well, that's not quite it. Um, the words that we're using even to describe it in, introduce errors in yeah. our understanding. Um, but they might be the right words in a certain situation, in a sure. certain relationship. Truth is a relationship function. So, yeah, what, what you say might, might be... Um, it, it carries some truth. Um, maybe to you at this moment, it is, it is true. I'm not saying that there is no such thing as truth or that it's relative or that we make it up. I'm not saying that. But words that carry truth in one interaction may not carry truth in another interaction. Um, and I'm, I realize I'm kind of dancing around here and I, I, I feel free to try to pin me down on something. This is excellent back and forth. So we have a evolutionary trajectory embedded within this creation that is ascending over time. And whether we're letting go to the process of ascension or we're actually building the new world that our hearts know is possible. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to envision the new world our hearts know is possible when we're all completely letting go, but it's also hard for me to envision the new world our hearts all know is possible when we're all just builders. Mm -hmm. But there's, yeah. yeah, so... There's a time for each. A time for each. Yeah. So, so then what is the point of the teleology, the purpose why are we embedded in this creation? Why was this creation made? Why are we endeavoring into consciousness here? Yeah. Why yeah. are we experiencing this ascension? What does it teach us? Is it a teaching function? What are we, what are we doing? The purpose of creation and ourselves in it is for creation to become more and more alive. That is the natural tendency of all things, of the universe, to become more and more complex, uh, to become, to, to grow into more and more layers of complexity, to, to become more alive. You can see the, the, the organic t tendency toward life anytime you uh, leave a parking lot alone for 20 or 30 years. If you don't maintain that in a state of unlife, then cracks form, like uniformity becomes um, 
uh, non-uniform. And then weeds grow up through the cracks. And over time, it becomes more and more alive. It can only hold it in a state of death, uh, in a state of stasis, with a lot of effort. That's, so that's an example. Uh, and you can look at the history of the Earth, you know, becoming more and more alive, more and more complex. So human, the advent of human beings on Earth is introducing the possibility of a next level of complexification, mm -hmm. where, where we ha have um, ways of exchanging information that are new, and therefore new levels of life. So the multicellular body is, is one level of life, and then a society, a civilization, that's a new level. And this is just the beginning. Where we are going is totally inconceivable. But that is our, that's why we're here. That's why we're created, is to participate in the coming alive of the cosmos. Mm. And that's why, as an individual, if you are evaluating your life and trying to make a choice, the thing that makes you feel alive is the thing that is participating in life, that is serving life. You might be bribed or frightened, coerced, into spending your life energy on something that does not serve life. But you're not gonna feel fully alive doing it. You're not gonna feel like you're living your life. Mm -hmm. You'll feel like you're living the life someone's paying you to live. Mm -hmm. And there will be an unmet longing yeah. that constantly seeks satisfaction. Yes. And then this is what generates the economy, uh, the, the, the manufacturing of of artificial needs, you know, it's an addiction. If, if the one thing that you're really seeking is unavailable, which is to fully express your gifts and service to life, well, instead, here, you know, have a sports car. If you are missing the deep security of belonging, uh, of being part of, of the process of creation, because that's really what makes us feel at home, it's to belong in participation in the process of creation. If you're missing that, then you're gonna feel insecure. Mm -hmm. You're gonna feel not at home. Oh, maybe some financial security, some investments. Mm -hmm. um, and I could go through many, many addictions that all illustrate the same principle. Wow, all right, let's <clears throat> stay on this for a little bit. So we have the purpose of Creation is two words you used. You used alive and complexity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Life is the name that we give to a certain unfolding of complex of complexity. Okay. Yeah. Life is we get us giving the name to the unfolding of complexity. And then when we don't feel belonging to life and complexity then the propensity for us to fall <clears throat> away from beautiful bringing forth of our gifts into the world, we yeah. succumb to that. One more, one more thought on that page is this idea of the Ouroboros theory of source, that rather than thinking linearly from simplicity to complexity, that we think cyclically, that once we have the initial source code that made us, that made creation, that we then embed that in our complexity and start the next mm -hmm. cycle of creation, of life mm -hmm. evolving to complexity again, and that therefore we are embedded right in it and that this function this objective function as you list is life and complexity and then more life more alive creation feeling more alive yeah more conscious experience more finding meaning 
we're finding expressing creativity would those be good words would you say meaning consciousness creativity gifts gems uh-huh yeah i could um play with any of those words um the discovery and or construction of meaning is part of the the, the search for meaning let's say is part of the expression of it's just like the questing that i mentioned at the beginning like what is the quest what is a quest the quest is a journey with a sacred purpose so ultimately pilgrimage is another Pilgrimage is the female counterpart of a quest. Mm. A quest is a, a masculine journey. Uh, a pilgrimage is a feminine journey. And both of them are necessary. The pilgrimage does not know its object. Mm. Pilgrimage is, is a state of openness. Oh. It's a journey that, that you're, in which you're open to receive something from beyond your knowing. And quest knows the object. A quest is, is very goal-oriented. Okay. Yeah, pilgrimage is open, non. Yeah, that's the way I'm. I'm hmm. engaging it anyway. I mean, okay. you know, these words can be used in whatever okay. you, whatever way you like. Okay. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, pilgrimage. You're not actually properly. You're not trying to accomplish anything that you know. Mm. You're opening yourself to be accomplished mm. by something. Um, by a place. Something's going to happen to you. Anyway, yeah. So what is the quest? What is the sacred purpose? Mm -hmm. What is the driver of our questions? Why do you want to know the answers to these, to these me metaphysical questions? Like, what, where's this curiosity coming from? Mm. And I would say that it is an expression of, the, the, of your deep imperative to participate more fully in the coming alive of the universe. That's a great That's what drives it. So the feeling of many of us here caring more for these questions, the feeling is being channeled by creation itself wanting to feel more alive and belonging in the path of ascension. Yeah, I mean, I don't usually think of it in terms of ascension. Why do you not uh, think of it in terms of ascension? Well, I mean, this goes back thousands of years to the advent of civilization uh, in which there were, with the advent of social classes, at the bottom was the farmer and, and at the top was the king and the priests. And in the middle were artisans and soldiers and things like that. So if you wanted to um, raise your status... I mean, even like that word, why, why, why is high good and low bad? Well, this has an origin in that time when, when the, the low, the, 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 the inferior, I mean, all of these are, are using the same uh, value system that high is good and low is bad. That originated because farmers were, were the, um, they were close to the soil and progress meant uh, you know, progress in your status in society, <clears throat> excuse me, meant ascending the social hierarchy until you were the king and your feet were not even allowed to touch the ground. In a lot of ancient societies, the, feet, the king's feet were not allowed to touch the ground. The priest's temple was separate from the earth and from the soil. So this became encoded in a paradigm of progress that says that our destiny is to rise above nature, to be no longer dependent on nature, to be spiritual, to be intellectual, to be rational. Therefore, the most prestigious of the sciences is theoretical physics, the most abstract, or maybe mathematics. You know, that's the most abstract, much more uh, prestigious than applied physics, which is more prestigious than engineering which is more prestigious than plumbing, which is more prestigious than farming. So that's, that's the, the order. So this whole idea of ascension 
of leaving matter behind, of abstracting ourselves from going, for, of going off into space, of entering the pristine world of the mind or the pristine world of the spirit, uh, where you are not dirty. Why is dirty bad? Why do we associate spirituality with cleanliness? Why do they wear white robes? Uh, why do we speak of high vibrations? This all encodes a, a value system that's rooted in the original hierarchical structures of the first mass civilizations. But on, on the other hand, we know like, that, like, we're, we're, that, that, that is changing now. A lot of people want to go back to the land. They want to have their hands in the soil. They want to, they don't use usually the term, but I would like to lower my vibration. I would like to reincorporate some of the suppressed low vibrations to be more earthy. Is a bassoon worse than a flute? You know, why is higher better than lower? Why does superior mean better? This is, you can see from this the, the depth of the undoing that is upon us or the depth of the revolution that is upon us to overturn that fundamental paradigm to embrace our fullness as material beings and not seek to escape into spirituality a materiality to, to let me rephrase that not to seek to escape a materiality that has been made almost uninhabitable because of the very effort to escape materiality. The denial of the sacredness of the material makes the material into something profane, makes it into commodities, makes it into parking lots and strip mines and an ugly, very efficient, but ugly constructed world that has been stripped of its qualities leaving only its quantities. That is not a fit habitation for the human soul. So of course we seek to escape into some um, spiritual world. But that's because we've rendered the material world profane. The revolution that we're in, that you are part of, is to take a different course to stop doing that, to bring the material and the spiritual back together, mm -hmm. to reinvest the world with sacredness, mm -hmm. to unify mind and body, to unify heart and, and mind. Mm -hmm. um, that's what is upon us today, or that's the opportunity that we have. And nothing less will enable us to fully participate in the creative process of the universe. Okay, so then that is one of the core principles, if not the core principle of aliveness of creation is the bringing together of the heart and the mind. And you gave us these examples throughout. The hierarchy is such a very serious conversational topic. And and it's very interesting hearing from you about people being at the low, farming, people being at the high that could never touch the ground on being as close to the gods as possible. Very interesting. But also that the idea of a hierarchy of decision goes all the way back to the initial bits of life that existed, period. Life had to decide, even at the single cell organism level, when to go and find food, when it was ready to divide. These had to happen, these decisions had to happen, just like even today with us, we have to say, stomach empty, food, priority. You know, these are just embedded. But is there then a, how do you then, is, is there some sort of like hierarchical approach that, comes with I, I, I know you I, I don't think hierarchy is bad I'm not anti-hierarchy okay yeah so and, then and I'm not anti-structure how does a hierarchy work with this and again you didn't use this process of or you didn't use this word of ascension you actually kind of described in a way why you weren't using the word ascension because we right. are kind of we're fishing back down 
to find these roots of our interconnectedness with nature and boomerang that back up to where we hope to continue evolving. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the, the Yeah, mechanism? it's incorporating some missing pieces, some neglected pieces that are invisible from within our operating maps. So, you know, we can return to that metaphor as well. Things that are barely even recognized to exist or are relegated to the margins or devalued. In our economic system, for example, um, anything that is not easily convertible into money tends to get devalued. It gets even love, intimacy, family. It's not that we say that those are not important, but what do you have less and less time for the more you are immersed in a money economy? What gets functionally pushed to the edges? The way that I recently unpacked it myself was I think the first thing that goes is sleep. Mm -hmm. which we spend a third of our lives doing and is so crucial to our wellness. Mm -hmm. So crucial. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the next thing that goes, like you were, I think, just listing, love, family, time right. with your kids and your friends. and Because right. why? Because I need to climb up the hierarchy. I need to make more money. I need to... Or it could just be economic desperation. You know, it's not necessarily that, that you're possessed by a delusion. I mean, a lot of, I think the uh, median income in the United States is like, it's under $40,000. Mm -hmm. You know, people are, are working, you know, two or three jobs. Um, so it's not that, you know, people adopt these distorted values. It's that, that the system um, enforces these values, whether we embrace them or not. So systemically, yeah, what gets pushed out to the outskirts, to the margins, what gets sacrificed? It's the things that are not measurable. If something's not measurable, if it's a qualitative mm. property of life, then it's really hard to subject it to the market, mm -hmm. to incorporate it into economic growth. And so we see, we have a society that is getting richer and richer in everything that we can measure. Like we have twice the floor space per capita as we did in the 1950s mm -hmm. or 1960s. We have... But well-being, right? right? These, yeah, right. This is what gets sacrificed, the things we can't measure, like community. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, you can kind of quantify leisure, but it really, the, the essence of leisure escapes quantification. You can measure time, but you can't measure how you feel in that time. Mm. Do you feel like you are on your own timeline, that there's nothing hanging over your head? Mm -hmm. So people might have actually, I think, even measurable leisure peaked in the 1970s in the United States. I read that somewhere. I don't know if it's true, but... but yeah, because yeah. that is around the same time that median male income became stagnating. Mm -hmm compared to the GDP, which is continuing to right. increase. Yeah, in a where lot of are, ways. Where are yeah. those fruits going? Yeah. Apparently, 50% of all new income that's generated goes to the 1%, uh -huh. which is mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. And the, well, well, then the question is, what, how, well, first is, how did they do that? What, what were they, were they, were they providing extremely great value to society? Were they reshaping rules and regulations in just their own favor? And could it potentially be that people that are of such a high amount of money making have the greatest amount of potential to increase the amount of aliveness that this creation roars with but this is a very tough thing to dive into and understand yeah yeah i mean we could talk about that you know my, my, my point was more of of the um the systemically enforced values um of the quantifiable the you economic know, we, we, machinery, in a right. sense. That's right, yeah. I like, you're and, and born not, as a child and you become embedded 
in the economic machinery. There's like no exit door left right. on the economic machinery. And, and the non-economic parts of life uh, have receded, over, or certainly over my lifetime. There, there used to be a lot more of life that was not in the money realm. Yeah. You know, like if you needed to fix your roof, you might not even hire roofers. Like some neighbors might get together and help you. Um, that maybe was more in my father's generation than in my generation, but there was still some of that left. Childcare was often not a paid service. You know, neighbors would watch the kids and so forth. Cooking was not a paid service. Mom cooked. You didn't, supermarkets didn't have delis or they didn't have like prepared food. Um, people didn't eat in restaurants as much. Um, advice, companionship. Uh, you know, you, you didn't go to a life coach uh, or a counselor as much as you do today. So many functions have entered the money realm that were not in it before. Because it's so crucial to increase the GDP. It's, well, it's, it's systemically that, necessary to increase the GDP. Yeah, there's like a, a um, These value are sacred assignment. activities? No worries. Let's add, throw them in that economic machinery. Right, but, but what I'm saying is that it's not just, you know, some dogma that GDP, you know, GDP represents well-being. Like that, there is that dogma, but the growth of GDP, economic growth is systemically necessary in a system where money is created as interest-bearing debt. That's what I, I wrote a whole book about that. Um, and it's a, it's a mistake, it's an inaccuracy, let's say, to blame all that's happening on the greed of wealthy people or the, the, the um, nefarious plots of the power elite or something like that. All of that is a symptom. Greed is a symptom. Um, the, the, neoliberal austerity programs are a symptom of a deeper imperative uh, of the system. And that imperative of growth is embedded in the mythology, the defining stories of civilization, which is, in, in those stories, growth is, is, um, is our destiny, the expansion of the human realm. Mm -hmm. This is been what civilization has been about, the conquest of nature for thousands of years. And even in science too, it's to the ambition of science is to bring more and more of the world mm -hmm. into the realm of the quantitative. Something in science is only real if you can measure it, if you can describe it with numbers. To, to treat something scientifically, you have to make data out of it. Like how would you, like what would be a scientific treatment of emotions. You'd have to describe them in terms of, mm. um, you know, neural Connectome. patterns yeah. and peptides and neurotransmitters and, you know, something that you could measure. Then it's a science. So science mirrors economics in that we have an expansion of the quantified realm and a shrinking of that which cannot be measured or quantified. So that's part of the stripping of sacredness from matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really abstract. I hope I didn't go too far. That's into that, beautiful, but, though. Yeah. Okay, so as we grow, which we're on trajectory to continue growing and becoming more alive, that again, this boomerang function of going and grabbing that initial interconnectedness of all things, the nature, the beauty, those things and embedding them in our future. So this seems like, okay, we're in creation. Creation is about increasing aliveness and complexity. In order for us to best do that, where we are today is to look back at some of the things from our past as a deep, again, aliveness of interconnectedness, of unity, of nature, of these types of things, and embed them in as we go forward. So. In a sense, I was mentioning this to you before we started, it really feels like things are moving in the direction of making super intelligence. Mm -hmm. Everyone and their mother is talking about AI. Everyone's now talking about quantum supremacy. People mm -hmm. are talking about indistinguishable virtual realities, neurotech, biotech. Everything is up and up and up and up and up. And up. Yet, 
the most popular things that people are watching on video in China and the United States are many times these primitive technology YouTube channels and on their uh, Chinese core lit platforms that people are literally watching how we used to hunt and gather and mm. build with our hands in nature and embedded in the trees mm. while we program super intelligence. How does that function sit with you? Okay. All right. So first I'll say that I'm not, you know, opposed to AI or opposed. I don't think that this is all a big mistake, but I think that um, we have to recognize the what the appropriate application of the technologies of quantity is. What is the appropriate application of the technologies of quantity? They can accomplish certain things, but the, it is a mistake to think that everything can be brought into that realm. So, yeah, so like take AI. If you can describe a problem um, numerically, like if you can define, a, a, define a, a desired outcome in terms of some data, like say chess, you know, like there's, there's no ambiguity about what victory is in chess. You can describe that algorithmically and you can then create a self, self-adjusting artificial intelligence program that can play chess better than a human being can. Competitive self-play is the big key, yeah. Right, yeah. right. I mean, and those can even outperform brute force chess engines. Uh, so like Mila and um, Alpha Zero, right? The more general question of can AI uh, outperform human intelligence in every way depends on an assumption that all expressions of human intelligence are in at bottom quantitative, that everything that a, that a human being is and does is somehow reducible to a data set. Mm -hmm. That and it's the same ideology that is at the basis of science that says everything that is real is measurable. This goes back to Galileo. Mm -hmm. The ambition of science is to encompass everything in number. That to assume that is possible is to make a is to make a statement about that. That is a metaphysical statement. It is a doctrine about reality. Only the measurable is real, and that everything is measurable. Everything can be reduced to quantity. Maybe it's true, but we have to recognize that that is an assumption. And what I have observed is that, like if you look at AI generated art or something like that, um, there's always something missing in it. There's at least what I've seen. For now. Right, so is that always gonna be the case? Is there something in beauty that escapes quantity, mm. that is beyond quantity? Is there, is there something else? If there isn't, then yeah. Um, there's no reason why AI can't uh, become more human than human beings are because human beings aren't actually human. We're just a, um, we, we too are reducible to a bunch of space-time coordinates operated on by mathematical forces. That has been the reigning ideology for a couple hundred years. Most human beings who have lived on Earth did not think that. They didn't think that nature was, in essence, predictable and controllable. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are discovering that it, as well, that it is not. That there are, well, I could go in different directions with that, but I'll, maybe I'll just pause right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's w within me this urge to understand from you, from your perspective, that it seems to be more and more that 
there is this desire for owning nature, owning other humans, owning the planet, owning the next celestial bodies that we go to, owning the substrate that everybody goes into to play in these virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. It's all about who owns it. Mm -hmm. All about that. Yeah. What forces are at play in creation that are not tangible and visible here in this physical world? Um... I'm trying to decide whether to to comment on the expansion of the realm of the owned or your, where you got to from that. I'm trying to see the link. Mm -hmm. um, it seems as though that expansion of the world of the owned is there are there are forces channeling through. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the desire to expand the realm of the owned or let's take it on a personal level, the desire to own more and more to is is the desire to expand the separate self mm. and to exert to it's it's a desire to dominate if you own something then you decide what happens to it you get to this is the ancient roman concept of ownership you can can't remember the roman the latin but it was you know you can use it or abuse it you can do with anything anything you want with it it's yours it's as if it becomes part of you so what is the origin of this desire to expand the self. Mm -hmm. I think it is because of the stripping of the full complement of relationships that um, are the, the true self. The true self is not a separate individual. The true self is not a, a skin encapsulated ego. It's not a bubble of psychology inside of a flesh robot. The, the, that, that is a truncated version of the self. The true self is a, is, is, is a um, nexus of relationships that include everything. It is a holographic mirror of all that is. So, or more practically speaking, like historically or prehistorically, to exist meant if you if you were alive, then you were in deep intimate relationship with every person and every every feature of the landscape, every bird, every tree, every plant, everything. You knew them really well, and they knew you really well. You you, you knew the story of every person that you saw, and you knew their grandfather's story. Uh, there was no pretending, actually because you were so deeply known. That is what it's like to be at home in the world. So in an industrial society, most of those relationships are stripped from us. We, we, and, and so and we're, we're cast into a sea of strangers, uh, other people and the trees. Like how many people in the United States could identify more than 10 different trees, mm -hmm. much less know when each tree flowers. But 10 different brands, no problem. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and so, so the, the atrophy of our full relatedness leaves us profoundly insecure. The, the infinite connected self has been cordoned off into this cramped, um, lonely, separate self. And so what does that separate self want? It wants to recover its lost beingness. One way to recover that lost beingness is to seek to expand itself by getting more money, more property, more control, more domination. This will never achieve its desire because the desire is for an infinite web of, re of relations. So how much of the finite does it take to compensate for the loss of the infinite? Mm -hmm. yeah. How much of the profane does it take to compensate for the loss of the sacred? Mm -hmm. How much 
pornography does it take to compensate for the loss of intimacy? Mm -hmm. How much social status does it take to compensate for the loss of respect? An infinite amount is what it takes. So that generates greed and the desire to expand the realm of the owned. So everybody's burdened with that, with that hunger. Everybody is, is um, experiencing that poverty. So of course we generate a society where everybody's trying to get more and more and more. And what do you think is at play going on through people? Who are the players in creation that are coming through humans on this big board game of risk, monopoly, sims? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you could look at it in terms of archetypal forces playing themselves out, um, evil forces. But ultimately, they too are in service of creation. They too are in service of the world coming more, of the universe even, coming more and more alive. The journey of separation has brought with it a tremendous development. Okay, so we have the creation's objective function of becoming more alive, and then we have the uh, the even entities or other forces that are at play that are in service to aliveness, that are archetypal forces that are then at play through us to make this an interesting process of becoming mm-hmm. more alive. Yeah, those forces, those beings may not know that they are in service to the universe becoming more alive, but they are part of this inconceivably mysterious orchestration. Everything is born into the universe for for a reason, and it's always the same reason, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what would you say these forces are? Uh, They are beings. What are these beings? There's many, many kinds of these beings and different cultures have different names for them. Um, Yeah, I I don't have my favorite typology. Um, There's many ways to look at it. Yeah, I mean, we could go into, you know, I mean, there's whole... uh, it seems like taxonomies of you know extraterrestrials or uh, mm, yeah. uh, non-material beings. Um, sure. Yeah, I haven't. You know, I have I have some of these taxonomies on my radar screen, but I haven't um, elaborated on them in detail. You have to ask somebody else about that, and we, and different people have different answers. We've had a couple. People on the show that talk about you're right. There's different answers. The tax and tax taxonomy of the classification of forces or entities that are at play through us on the planet is fascinating. And then we also very frequently talk about the interplay between them in this what seems like both a beautiful aliveness that's coming, but also this predation farm a predation farm and a aliveness that are yeah going up at the right. same so uh, so yeah and the line is becoming so much more thin that it's becoming more transparent you can tell who is awake and who is not more and more easily through the transparency that is coming with the internet and exponential technology okay so so let me let me say that okay that, like, okay, so let's step into the world of nefarious evil forces, um, uh, the negative alien agenda, okay. all that kind of stuff. Uh, I assume that you're a little bit, or maybe a lot, familiar with it. Okay. Um, these beings are only able to operate in, in co-resonance with a, uh, a human state of being. We're not their helpless victims, but our personal and collective uh, evolutionary stage 
um, necessitates these archetypal forces to be at play mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. um, they are part of the full exploration of the um, particular corner of the realm of separation that that mm -hmm. civilization is exploring right now. Mm -hmm. The more interconnected that we become, the more we feel belonging, the more we feel that unity, that then it's both the less we feel this need to dominate and control and the less that then these, these negative forces can come in and take root in our free will. Yeah. That's, yes, that's true. Uh, and humanity has been exploring an extreme of separation. The, the, the horror that has gone down on this planet is uh, almost unknown in the galaxy. Um, it's, it's this... It's super separate from the one. Yes, it's super separate. And right and now. and if this planet can come back from that place, if it can go on such a deep journey into separation, yeah. into prison planet, into the yeah. horror, and actually reintegrate, that is a new step of cosmic evolution. That That's would never have been, happened before. That would have been a pretty big boomerang throw into the craziness of the economic machinery and predation farm, all this type of stuff, Dopa yeah. dopamine monkeys, all this type of stuff that's that right. depression, anxiety, yeah. pump me up, right. yeah, and throw it all the way over there and then go be able to evolve through that towards the one, towards the interconnectedness of with right. nature and with each other, belonging, it's, it's, aliveness, that's a new right. step. It's the same principle as, as as like if you run into somebody who had like the most horrific childhood you can imagine, you know, tied to the bed by his father and beaten with a baseball bat and locked in a closet and made to eat his own shit. And like, I mean, you hear these stories sometimes and then you meet them and a lot of them, you know, end up doing the same to the next generation. But some of them yeah. become these radiant beings because of what they've healed from. Wow. And you recognize that they have done that healing on behalf of all beings to return to that theme. That's us on the micro level of an individual. That's, right. that's what this planet, that's the service that this planet is rendering. It doesn't guarantee that we're going to make it through. We could end up with a dead earth. We could destroy everything. But the... So there's no guarantees. Right. Just as there's no guarantee that the horribly abused child mm -hmm. is going to grow up to be uh, a, a radiant mm -hmm. uh, angel carrying love. Mm -hmm. But it can happen. And when it does happen, that is a medicine for the whole planet. We're getting through our traumas, but in order for us to really express our treasures <clears throat> galactically, universally, mm -hmm. is going to require a lot of sincere self-work to identify right. those traumas, heal but that, that is how radiant a being Earth can become if we can heal from this trauma that we've gone through. Every time somebody, like, that's what I say to people when I, when I, when I run into people who have really suffered horribly. I, I say, like, if you accomplish nothing else in your life but to heal and not pass that on, you're actually demonstrating a principle of healing to the whole planet. Mm -hmm. If it can happen to you, it can happen to everybody, it can happen to the planet. Yeah. You're shifting reality into alignment with your own healing yeah. by healing. And the same, yeah, on a planetary collective level, the same principle operates. So all of these negative forces, all these dark forces, they are actually rendering an evolutionary service to the galaxy or to the cosmos by creating the conditions for this healing to even happen. have yeah. to, to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And this um, resonates with certain Gnostic teachings mm -hmm. that say that the that um, the world is in the hands of a usurper, that that there's a false god that is actively making hell on earth. How is that a service? Well, being cast into this hell 
our um, roots it, it calls reach on us. down to hell and then <laughs> our 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 flowers and our leaves reach the heavens afterward yeah and and the capacities that we develop um when love is hard mm. when we have an intense gradient to go against mm. like we would never discover how powerful we are as lovers and as healers if we weren't in these adverse conditions if we were just gifted a utopic right. love scenario right mm -hmm. right and that's why the evil forces are actually rendering an evolutionary service this is super esoteric. I, I love I this. Know. I love this. I'm like, I'm like, are these like Silicon Valley like gearheads listening to this? And what are they thinking? Yeah, but anyway. yeah, yeah. You're you're great. Um, no, the audience is worldwide, uh, mm -hmm. and the audience is Im just. Embedded. I love gearheads, by the way. That wasn't Im an insult, but yeah. Embedded with people that care about science, spirituality, just overall this aliveness mm -hmm. process that's coming. So I mean, I don't often talk about this stuff. Like, you know, I'm that's out there what speaking about our, climate change. That's you know, our so. job. Our yeah. job is to get these profound wisdoms that don't normally come up mm -hmm. to shine uh, on the show so that other, right. other people can just be like, whoa, how do I take that and run with it? And Because mm -hmm. you're highlighting the importance of healing there was so beautiful that we had, that we go through this process of the that cr creation has the negative entities that have the hold on this on this predation farm at times that then creates the incredible amount of love that there's no guarantees that we get through the little tiny pinhole that we have to get through in order to make sure that mm -hmm. we that we continue the process of aliveness uh, but when we do we will have learned and loved at unprecedented capacities that then we yeah. embed in where we go. I think that's very beautiful. And there's a bigger mystery yeah. here too. Okay. Um, even if this planet doesn't make it, uh, still every contribution we make toward this passage still registers an effect. So this is hard to understand from the perspective of linear time. Mm -hmm. But no action is wasted. Every yeah. experience, moment to moment, that you have in your adventure of consciousness goes to creation. It goes right. to source. Right. And whether the entire planet ceases to exist in a couple hundred years yeah. or not. And besides, there's not actually one future. How many are there? There are many future timelines that are converging on the present and they uh you know they're in a quantum superposition so which one is the real future and this is actually through the past too there's not just one past so there's an infinite amount of earth's orbiting stars that have charles and alan talking well you could say that but then you run into the problem of what does is mean because is as we use it encodes uh, a cartesian reality um, where something either is or it isn't but can so you know, we get a superposition yeah okay but but okay. you could just say that there are many futures and which one becomes real is the one that we come into relationship with with that we align to yeah and that all the futures yeah. exist and then we collapse the probability towards the one that we right. make a relationship with right yeah. Yeah. So which one do we want to So every act of towards? every act of love is a kind of a a quantum measurement mm. um, that puts us in relationship to a world of love. That's another way of That's a good way explaining of yep. morphic resonance. Mm -hmm. You know, you you are shape-shifting the world into alignment with every choice that you make, which means that every person is equally powerful on this earth. And every choice is equally impactful. Although one person that engages with a million people in their in the organization that they run or in the social sphere that they can send a message out to, they could potentially create a bigger splash of love. They can make a bigger wave on the surface. And on a short time scale, it may look as if they've had a bigger effect than the single mom 
taking care of an autistic child that never goes viral, yeah. that no one ever finds out about or celebrates. Yeah. But on, but those people are altering the deep currents that might surface only in 500 or 5,000 years. Yeah. But no yeah. less important than anything you're doing with your big platform. That's an important realization to have because then you'll no longer value the big over the small. You won't necessarily devalue the big. Maybe your calling is to do something you know, on this level, but you won't think that you're more important than anybody else. That's also a very interesting thing to quantify slash <clears throat> feel that it becomes part of your ethos when someone sits with millions of people that they can disseminate content to versus someone that's, like you said, r raising a child that is having troubled experiences yeah. with the natural world that... Maybe like the care that goes into raising that child, maybe because of that, that child turns into a wonderful parent himself. Sure. And maybe sure. that gets passed down and passed down and passed down. And maybe in 500 years, that's the person who is, you know, the global sure. leader. Doing incredible work just yeah. because of that. Just because of that thing mom that happened 500 with years child. ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know okay. how this world works. Okay, that's, yeah. that's beautifully said. You, we go a couple uh, generations into the future and you can see incredible uh, effects of that. Yeah, that butterfly effect take mm -hmm. off. Okay. I want to ask you about solutions. There are a lot of things that are being propagated as solutions to our boomeranging, going towards that interconnectedness and bringing that up as we build the super intelligence mm -hmm. and as we bring more aliveness to the world. One of the things that's really powerful is, of course, the use of meditation, the use of psychedelics, the use of these inward experiences but also bringing it outward, bringing it out into the world, bringing that love forth in those increments. Another one that's literally a part of our social contract is inclusive stakeholding. So moving away from self-dealing, which happened, which did not happen as much back in the day where you had me telling you a story for our inclusive fitness versus now telling you a story for self-dealing. So this idea of inclusive fitness, inclusive stakeholding is that I gate, I give the opportunity to, through tokenomics, through a bunch of different methodologies, uh -huh. to bring everyone in as a stakeholder of the future. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the classic example of the drivers of the cars and the people riding in the cars as getting nothing but getting tokens of ownership. The community that the company mm -hmm. is in gets tokens of ownership. The physician yeah. and the patient have an inclusive stakeholding relationship, the teacher and the student. How do you like that as a solution? Well, I think it would be easy to critique those things, but I think that they are, um, they are uh, a kind of a groping toward um, the recovery of the principle of gift into economics. They are, yeah. They're, they're coming from an understanding that, that where we want to go is, is a world that, that expresses and embodies the principle that um, we're all in this together, that your well-being is to my benefit too. Yes. Which is different from the classic laissez-faire economy where we're all in competition with each other and if you gain the means to repay your debts, then that deprives me of that money in this scarcity-based system. Uh, we're in competition for each other. If you get the job, I don't, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Like That is contrary to nature. I mean, there is competition in nature, but fundamentally, ecology is a circle of gift. Mm -hmm. the, the, if one species is removed, extinguished, everybody suffers. The whole system gets less resilient. Every species is, as I said earlier, um, born into being to contribute to the aliveness of the whole. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true in a social ecology in a mature meta-organism that humanity wants to become. So these, these systems that you're talking about are kind of reaching for uh, an economy in which 
more for you is more for me, just as it was in an ancient gift economy, where if you were very successful, if you were very excellent, if you were a great hunter, if you were really clever, then everybody would benefit from that mm -hmm. because you didn't keep and hoard for yourself. Wealth was not an individual function. The best place to store extra food is in your friend's stomach. Right. Yeah, that was a quote from an indigenous person that I mentioned in my book. I store my meat in the belly of my brother. Because like this guy was like, the anthropologist said, why don't you store your meat? Why don't you smoke it? Why don't you keep it? You know, you get a big, you kill a big game and you have a feast and you give it away to everybody and the next day you have none left. <clears throat> and you could have security for a month. Why do you do that? And he was like, yeah, you don't understand. I, I do store meat. It's in the belly of my brother. He's generous. And then everybody's going to invite him to his feast too. That's how an economy could work, mm -hmm. where you celebrate the success of somebody else because now they're going to have more to share. Compersion. I feel joy when you feel joy. Yeah. Right. So that's a, a, a spiritual principle. It's a movement of consciousness, but it has not yet manifested in our economic systems, in our organizations. So we're striving for that and trying out all these experiments. So in their actual mechanics, you know, I might be able to critique tokenization or um, you know, all of these social currencies and things like that. I mean, there's definitely things to critique about them, but the underlying impulse, I believe, is a uh, transition to gift economy. Yeah. Yeah. So then how about strategies for non-separation, experiences of non-separation? Hmm. Yeah. For me, these experiences come as a gift. They're not something that I can, that I, from a place of separation, can engineer. But I can create an invitation for those experiences um, to find me. The search generates the discovery. It's like in The Matrix. Uh, if you remember, uh, Neo is on his computer typing in what is the matrix. He's searching. But no matter where his, what he's searching, everything, his entire search is happening inside the matrix. But his search, the sincerity and commitment of his search makes him visible to Morpheus so that Morpheus is able to find him because of the diligence of his search. Mm -hmm. And then in their first interview, he, he says, I've been looking for you for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think that our, our sincerity and our hopeless efforts to transcend the matrix that we are trapped in is what makes us findable by those beings that are wanting to liberate us from the matrix. And those... So those experiences of non-separation, they are, they are the instruments of that liberation. We incrementally bring in that with our will into the potential futures that exist. And then we are then brought that gift. We're met with that gift of finding more modalities of non-separation. Yeah. Experiences of it. Right. So all of these modalities, um, none of them are a guarantee. You know, you could meditate for 20 years and not have a transcendent experience. Yeah. As someone that's obsessed with creation design, mm. so literally being creation and designing the world that makes aliveness, more and more aliveness, how would you design creation? I would start by recognizing that any creation worth living in would be far beyond my capacity to design it. Uh, and to see myself, therefore, as a participant in a design that is unfolding, that is well beyond my understanding, that I might be able to contribute to. And then it becomes a matter of, of listening for or, or watching for the next unfolding of that design that calls me into participation. 
and, and to learn to recognize what is mine to do, what is my role to play, uh, what is my gift to give, uh, how can I make myself available as one of the instruments of a designer beyond my knowing. My puny attempts to design something, such as in the Sacred Economics book, mm -hmm. like I recognize those probably probably everything I'm saying is wrong in those. Probably if, if these were actually in, implemented, they would fail miserably. But their failure would, would be a stepping stone toward a next failure and a next failure and a next failure, which ultimately would add up to a what you might call a success. More and more closer to the pinnacle of what we're aiming to achieve. Yeah. Well, these failures are part Stepping of the stones. design process. Yeah. Of a greater designer. Part of the creation process. Yeah. yeah. I'm obsessed with that designer question, and it's interesting hearing people's. Yeah, yeah I mean, this idea that, 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 see, this is part of an ideology that holds the, the universe outside of ourselves as without intelligence and then arrogates to human beings the sacred duty of imposing intelligence onto a world that has none, imposing order onto a world that has none. It's the ideology that says that the natural tendency of the universe is towards disorder, toward entropy, toward thermodynamic dissolution. Um, and that is really an obsolete scientific view. The tendency of the universe, as I keep saying, is toward complexity. If that's the case, if there is um, an intelligence not outside the universe guiding it, not outside materiality, but inherent in materiality, if there is a, a organic constitutional movement toward order, toward complexity, then we no longer have to be the imposers of order. We no longer have to be the designers. So, but we can design yeah. with the source code to go towards complexity. Yeah, we can participate in the unfolding of complexity. We but can we're not we're not like in the central driver's seat, nor will we ever be. Why will we not be if our we can try, but we will recognize how limited we are as we do so. And the process of recognizing our limitations, mm -hmm. the humiliation of crashing into our limitations. We thought we knew. We thought we knew how to do this. We thought we, we could design a perfect society or a perfect world and look what happened. That learning process is part of a larger transhuman design process, like to set us up to fail, but it creates movement. It's part of the. It's part of these feedback loops, uh, these these nonlinear feedback loops that are so much bigger than humanity. So I'm not saying don't try, mm -hmm. um, but if you can recognize that that everything that we work with in our design toolkit is based on such a limited map, yes, then maybe that recognition will allow us to learn more quickly from our mistakes, to not hold on to, the, um, to something that's not working. But we gain more and more insight about the totality of the map of creation as we probe it more and more. Right. And then we, if possible, to gain all insight about the source code, the underlying source code from the initial source until today, the roaring complexity that exists and then to be able to create another cycle of that ourselves or quadrillions of cycles of yeah. that. The source code is, is infinite. Because then how else does it create more aliveness but through, yeah. but through us making more? Mm -hmm. That's part of the process, yeah. What other things make more aliveness besides us making more? creations, making more cycles. Well, there are many, many beings in the universe that are part of the unfolding of aliveness. What other beings? Uh, elemental beings, um, solar beings, what extraterrestrial are beings. What are those? What are elemental and solar beings? Mm. 
they really they are patterns of information and energy they are you know self sustaining um, sometimes replicating patterns of information and energy um, that are sometimes vastly more complex than a human being is or just very different than a human being is. I'm not an expert on these beings. I, I just know that they exist. Okay. There are beings like this is like, I don't know, this might disqualify me from any serious conversation, but I believe that there are beings inside the sun that are alive. The sun is way more complex than people think. It's not just this this nuclear um, fusion uniform sure. ball of fusing hydrogen gas. Yeah. Like the the electromagnetic structures in the sun are, are enduring and and incredibly complex. Uh, there's no rational reason to think that the sun is not alive. And most human beings who have ever been on earth recognized that the sun is alive. Most human beings on earth think it's the god. Not necessarily. I a mean, a lot of people did think it's god. A god. It is yeah. in many ways the thing that gave us life yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's definitely part but, of it. But but most people lived in a world full of beings. Surrounded by beings. Everything is a being. Okay, so potentially the birth of a star is the birth of life, or the birth of elements is a birth of a life. Or... You might be reincarnated as a star. Imagine that. You might be reincarnated as a planet. You might be reincarnated as a rock. It's interesting thinking how that feels. That's that's my favorite stuff. Is what is the mm -hmm. conscious experience of a star or a planet, etc. Or a rock. Or a rock. Yeah, there that are. Gets, that just gets like rained on by water. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there. Are... <laughs> Rocks are very quiet. So yeah. how connected would you be to all that is all the time? Sure. On the note of quadrillions of simulations and us playing God, do you feel like this is a simulation? If this is a simulation, then what is a simulation? Yes. Like, we have an idea of what a simulation is. But to say that reality is a simulation already changes what the word simulation means. This is this is an, this is a very old philosophical riddle, the brains in vats uh, proposition. You know, what if what if this isn't real? What if this is just we're all brains in vats, like in the Matrix, and we're just you know given the simulation of reality, which is just the stimulation of neurons in these brains and vats. Well, what we mean by real is nothing other than these simulations so i think it's a meaningless proposition but but where it's going to is basically to recognize that there are um, um that the reality that we're familiar with is is a tiny corner of what is really there um, mm -hmm. is yeah. Is humanity a biological bootloader for digital superintelligence? That is maybe only... That might be part of what we are. Digital superintelligence is an unfolding of complexity, but as I said before, its domain is very limited. From a quantitative mindset, it seems like its domain is, is huge and that we could do anything with it. It could accomplish anything. But it, its accomplishments are limited to the tiny corner of the universe that is the that is the realm of quantity. The things that can be achieved through the manipulation of data and number are, um, they look huge from where we are in a society that is dominated by quantity. All that stuff I talked about before by, by efficiency, by the maximization of some measurable thing. Um, that's what efficiency means by money, right? 
another form of measure. So it seems like we're like the frog at the bottom of the well. And it looks like, and the well is the well of the quantitative, and therefore the, in principle, controllable. It's, it's, it's this narrow realm that we have declared ourselves the lords of, but it is very, very narrow. It's, it's a tiny piece of reality. And there, are, there have been and still are cultures on this planet that are living in a much vaster realm and able to accomplish things that are totally beyond anything we or any of our AI could ever accomplish. What are those things? So, for example, um, a uh, I uh, this is a bit of a leap, but I um, spoke to some Dogon about climate change. Asked them, "What do you guys think about climate change?" And they said, "Oh yeah, climate is really spinning out of control, and the reason is that you've been taking sacred artifacts that have been buried ceremonially or placed ceremonially in key power places on the Earth, and you've been taking them away and putting them in museums in New York and London." thereby disrupting the covenant that has been maintained between humans and the planet that, that allows the planet to maintain a habitation for humanity. And you're, you're disrupting that. So this is a technology that is completely off the radar screen. A technology, the technology of ceremony, the technology of Earth's power points, you cannot find those through any geological survey. The entire data set of all of the world's computers does not contain the information that is necessary to exercise that technology. If I ran the simulations and then I moved those artifacts in one and then watched the evolution of humanity and then I left them in the other and watched the evolution of humanity, we could see what the results are of things like that that are deemed to be so sacred that even super intelligence can figure it out. Yeah, but you can't, you, you, you can only run that experiment once. You can run it quadrillions of times in different permutations. That's the beauty of super intelligence. Well, you couldn't go back in time and move those artifacts and repeat the experiment. You only live once. Well, I would launch that many from the beginning and then be able mm -hmm. to observe their evolution and then launch another quadrillion if I'd like because we have the godlike superpowers of the source. But your domain. ability to, to, to simulate it depends on the um, doctrine that you can reduce all of reality to yes. a data set. Yeah, to a simple source code and yeah. that, that does also have complexity that's non data set oriented. So what I'm saying is that there, there are incredible capacities of human beings in relationship to transhuman powers that did not depend and do not depend on encompassing more and more of the world into a data set. That is a certain strategy mm -hmm. for engaging reality. I'm not saying it's useless or bad, yeah, yeah. but what I'm saying is that it is, it is limited. To achieve what the Dogon and other ancient cultures of course, of course. were able to achieve sacred, yes, through superintelligence. That requires a lot of effort. But to limit superintelligence to a data set, I think, also is myopic in a sense. There's more to it. We're cr well, we're crickets trying to imagine the big game. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's. I'm just sharing my view about it. I like this. And then, yeah. how about the last question that we like asking our guests? What do you think is the most beautiful thing in creation? The most beautiful thing? <laughs> it depends on the moment that you ask me. How about now? Hmm. 
Well, I'm looking at you. I was just feeling so the same don't thing. Don't take about it the wrong way. I was but, thinking you know, about you too. Yeah. 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 That shows presence, I think. Mm-hmm. I must also ask you, what has been your deepest experiential connection to creation? I'd say witnessing the birth of my children. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that totally took me apart, and uh, yeah. the pieces didn't get put together the same way. <laughs> have you have had that experience? <laughs> Not yet. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, but f- hearing from moms and from other people like yourself, it's like yeah, dads. It, mm-hmm. it just it just. Uh, yeah, that the, totally the changes piece. the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also want to make sure that we touch on this big picture synthesis as well. You mentioned it, and I think it's really beautiful. Creation, purpose to create life. More aliveness. Mm-hmm. The more. tendency of the universe is to become more and more alive and our purpose in it is to participate in the coming alive of the universe. Yeah, that's the that's the basic, my basic understanding. To participate in the coming aliveness of the universe. Mm-hmm. Mm. I love it. Charles, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> having me on. We're so I enjoyed honored. It. Thank you, thank you, thank mm-hmm. you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on this episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the conversations that we had on the show about these topics. Have more conversations about it and spread the word more around the world. Check out the links in the bio below as well. You have charleseisenstein.org. You have all of his book links. You have his Twitter profile. Check those out. Check out his books. Check out his website. Check out all that content, everyone. And also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders in your organizations, in your communities that you believe in around the world. Support them and help them grow. You can find all of our links below to our show. You can help us grow. Join us across any of those platforms below. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Experience those non-dual states of awareness. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we will see you soon. Peace.